Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Which isn't hardly any fun at all. It's just pretty tough stuff. Mark 13, I'm going to finish it tonight. Uh, it's only a few verses, verses 28 through 37. But some very important things, I think, to uh, culminate or cap what we've said about the second coming so far. I had read a lot of books about eschatology or the second coming, but uh, you find that when you go through it verse by verse, instead of reading someone's book about it, uh, it's just not quite as easy as folks want to make it. And I have come to the settled opinion in my own personal Bible study that there is no systematic eschatology in the Bible. Now, that does not mean there are no glimpses of truth and, not, and there, there, there isn't any prophetic foreshadowing. It simply means there is no, there is no, there is no scheme to, to lace them together in any kind of meaningful chronological order. And uh, that comes after much prayer about that because I wish there was a systematic eschatology. Uh, we, we could, I think, uh, understand clear what was happening, but I really feel like that our, our age is an age that has gone bananas on the future. And uh, one characteristic of that is in the religious circle, some people spend all of their time on the second coming to the exclusion of daily growth and daily witnessing and, and other things. So let me say to you that I, I think there's some clear pictures of the future here in Mark and Matthew and Luke, also in the Revelation and Thessalonians, especially in there too. But I think that we make a grave error when we try to fit them together. So let me remind you tonight that in my understanding, the 13th chapter of Mark is not a when will it occur, but Jesus answered their question of when by saying, be ready and not yet. So Jesus never really answered their question about, uh, they ask about what the signs of the destruction of Jerusalem be and the time of his coming, and he gave them some uh, general guidelines and some specific instructions. But he never even separated the two, really. He just kind of left it fluid, left it ambiguous. And tonight I think we'll see why he left it ambiguous. Please read in your translation... Verses 28 through 37, I'll give you a couple of minutes, and we'll come back and talk about it. Okay. There are some interesting things there, aren't there? Again, we come back to the fig tree. I really think the fig tree here is simply a agricultural or horticultural metaphor of uh, the nearness of these events. I, I remember chapter 12, verse 11 and following, and I, I remember... Chapter 11, verse 12 and following, excuse me. Remember Jesus using the fig tree as a, as a uh, picture of Israel. Remember that? As he left, came in Jerusalem that morning, he cursed the fig tree because nothing on it. So uh, my mind wants to say it's just an, a horticultural metaphor. And yet I, because of the context of the last few chapters, I just can't say it to, without, the, without adding that there's a possibility that he's still referring to Israel somehow. And the judgment is going to come on Jerusalem in this metaphor. But notice he says, Now, love the story of the fig tree. Now, fig trees are the only tree in Palestine that put their leaves out very, very, very late. The almond tree buds very quickly. The olive buds quickly. The other trees bud quickly. There's a real possibility of a cold snap. We, we have the same problem in Lubbock. All of you have fruit trees. Worry to death this time of the year because the things are budded and they're out. And one cold snap and your whole fruit crop's gone. Well, the fig tree is the tree that you, when it puts leaves out, you can be pretty sure no chance of frost anymore, okay? So it's the last tree to sprout. And so Jesus mentions that, and he says, just as soon as its branches grow tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Now, I want to talk about the word near for a minute. <clears throat> I want you to think with me clearly about it. 
the answer to discussion questions in your, in your brochure number five, how many of you expect to see Jesus Christ in your lifetime? Maybe you didn't understand the question. Because I thought it would be more than that. How many of you expect to see Jesus Christ coming again in your lifetime? Okay. I, I'm surprised it's not even more than that. The word near speaks of probability. It speaks of possibility. And I want to I want to somehow deal with those two in this in this area of Mark 13. As a student of church history, I know that every generation, and I'm including Peter and John and the rest, expected the Lord back in their lifetime. Many theologians criticize Paul for expecting the Lord back, and then they say he changed his theology later. I, I disagree with that completely. Uh, certainly, I think uh, I think Paul expected Jesus back. I think John did. I kind of think in the back of my mind that Jesus somehow thought he was coming back quicker than he was. But every group of believers, every generation has expected the Lord in their life. That's why you can just go back uh, 200 years ago and read commentators. And they will take the circumstances of their day and they will fit them into the biblical predictions. We're doing the same thing today. Hal Lindsey, I think, is a good example of someone trying to contemporize the biblical account. But it has happened in every age we've expected the Lord back. It is, it is part of the Christian hope that any day he may come. And I think the imminent return of Jesus Christ is something that we should not give up. I think we ought to expect him back in our lifetime. The very fact that Israel is in the land is a real pointer that maybe our day is the day. But, on the other hand, I feel like because of our tendency to place the second coming in our lifetime... It may be a reaction to the fear of death, and I, I don't know. I know that uh, I'm not really afraid of death so much I'm afraid of how I'm going to die. Remember the other day, uh, I don't know what I was doing. I guess I was playing racquetball or something. And I really got tired. I thought, <laughs> you all do the same thing. Don't you grin too much. I really got tired. I thought, I'm having a heart attack. <laughs> I know what I, as I, this is what it's was like. I, I, I got scared. Well, I, I have no doubt the Lord loves me that I have a place in heaven, but... I didn't want to die in the shower naked, you know. Just, <laughs> you just don't want to go like that. I just... <laughs> and I can't think about all the things I wanted to do, you know. So, I really don't think we're afraid of death. I think we're afraid of how, when, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, I heard it said we, we know where a home is, just not homesick yet. And that, there's, a, there's a sense of truth in that. On the other hand, I feel like that we do the Bible injustice by forcing it onto our age. I've seen it happen in the past, and I've seen it happen in our day. And I feel like that we've abused the biblical record by saying our day is the day. And we, we make our contemporary scene fit. And whatever it takes to make it fit, we'll make it fit. And that bothers me. So when I say the time is near, I want to hold out the possibility of any moment return at the same time that I hold out, there are some things that don't seem to have happened yet. Uh, the gospel preached around the world. We could say, well, there are satellites and it's been preached, but one reason I'm a great supporter of Wycliffe is there are tribes, thousands and thousands of people who have never heard the message of Jesus Christ, nor can they until someone goes and works with them. It talks about an intensification of evil with false messiahs arising and doing many mighty works and leading the elect away. I have not seen the state of apostasy that I'm expecting to see in the last days. I haven't seen the general falling away of what, quote, looked like the church but never was, and it seems to get sucked off into some... I haven't seen that. Now, there are cult groups. But as you'll notice, even the last chapter, Jesus, Jesus split people coming in my name from the false messiahs. He, he put quite a few verses between them. And I haven't seen that intensification. We say, well, yeah, but our age is so bad. Friends, if you, just, if you just check history, our age is not exceptionally evil from any other age. Our age is not exceptionally perverse. Uh, the Roman system was much more corrupt and perverse than our system is. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to excuse our system because it's bad. But uh, it's, it, it's the fact that we live here and now 
Now, that makes us think that now is the time. And uh, so when it says he's near, you realize he spoke this in somewhere around 33, 34, 35 A.D. And it was uh, 35 something years to the destruction of Jerusalem. And it was at least two centuries uh, before his coming. And so what the Bible means by near, I'm not sure that we understand. I think we tend to say close when it, when it is trying to say be ready. We want to say it's now when the Bible says keep alert. And uh, I think that is what, is what we've got here. Now, in verse 29 where it says, So when you see all these things taking place, all what things? That's a good question. All what things? I talked to you about historical, historical telescoping of events. And Jesus seems to deal with the destruction of Jerusalem and the second coming in the same, in the same way. And so, do these things mean the, the destruction of Jerusalem, or do they mean the second coming? Well, it's hard. It's really hard to know. And I'll even add one more problem in here for you. If you look back at Mark chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus said something like this, same kind of thing. He um, found the exact place. It's the, just before the transfiguration. Oh, yeah, Mark 9. You probably have it 839, but it should be Mark 9, 1. And he said to him, I solemnly say to you that some of the people standing here will certainly live to see the kingdom of God coming in its power. Uh, and many have thought that that's referring to the second coming, but it's referring to the transfiguration, I think. So it seems like that Jesus is using this, many will see this happen. If I had to vote, whether it was the destruction of Jerusalem or the, the last days dealing with the Antichrist, it seems to me that it has to be the destruction of Jerusalem that's talked about here when it says, see these things taking place. Now, when I say that about ver verse 30, I'm going to have to say something else about verse 32. <laughs> so let's just hold off before, you know, you feel like I'm totally taking away from the end time. I'm really not. I just think there is a blending here that's very hard to understand. What will be the sign of these things are taking place? You will know. You will know. Now, I don't know what your English translation has. It's a present imperative. You will know. And it's very emphatic. You will know, you will continue to know. You will know. Now, I, I don't know what that means. I'm sure it's, it's something in the sense about when you see the, the, the red sunset, you know that weather, certain kind of weather is coming. I, 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 I sense that here. He's saying, you're going to know what's going to happen when you see these kinds of things taking place. You say, what kind of things? The sun, the moon, the stars, turning black, falling from heaven. Uh, what? What kind of things? Well... The only way that I can make this passage meaningful is to relate these things that are going to come in this generation to the destruction of Jerusalem. Otherwise, Jesus was mistaken. And I have great problems with him being mistaken. Now, does your translation have, you will know that he is right at the door, something like that? Do you have the pronoun he capitalized? How many of you do have the pronoun he capitalized? Okay. Dad gum them. They have taken the neuter article and translated it by the masculine article just to fit their system of interpretation. Just like it was back over here in verse 14 where it says, mine has, you see the uh, destructive desecration standing where he has no right. They took the neuter article. It's, there is a masculine article that anybody who knew Greek, if they wanted to say he would have put the masculine article. But on purpose, they put the neuter article and the translators of whatever Bible y'all have changed it to the masculine article because of their eschatological presuppositions. And the same thing they did right here. And my translation is just as bad as yours in the sense that mine has he's at the door. It can't be he. It's got to be it. When you see it. Now, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. It may mean the uh, Roman uh, eagles in the sanctuary after the destruction of Jerusalem. It may mean the Antichrist in the end days. It seems to me it's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And you ought to change your translation to it instead of he. It is at the door. Verse 30, I solemnly say to you, this present generation will not pass away before all this takes place. Now, is that the Jewish generation that's going to see this judgment come on their nation? Is that what it's talking about? The Jews will recognize Jesus' words coming fulfills a perfect prophecy and turn to him? Or is it talking about the believers who were there, the disciples and their followers? Who is it talking about this generation? Well, I don't know. 
But I think it's talking about the people who were alive when Jesus was alive. I think we can at least say that. Whether it means Jews or believers, I don't think we can say. But it's talking about his generation, seems to me. And when you compare it to 9-1 or 8-39, whichever you have in your translation, it, it seems to say that all the more. Notice, his, notice his, the last little, little thing. Verse 31. Earth and sky will pass away. Now, what is that talking about? There is a theological thread throughout the Bible that the created order is going to be destroyed and then remade. You probably see it clearly in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 10. That's that very famous verse about the elements will be burnt up with heat and all that. <clears throat> I think that we can relate that to Romans chapter 8 and also to this, this, this apocalyptic language of the Old Testament about the sun turning red and the moon turning black and stars fall. There's going to be a cosmic upheaval when God steps into history for man's redemption. For the earth and the cosmos also fell because of man's sin. And the created order groans and, and, and longs for the revealing of the sons of God, Romans 8, because they're going to be set free too. So I think this destruction and recreation is, is something that we see all the way through. And I think it's something we shouldn't fear. Personally, I believe, not that we are going to go to heaven, but that heaven is coming to us. As, as you remember, our stay in Revelation. Uh, I think the dead and the Lord go to be with the Lord. I think it's in heaven. But the, the last picture we get is God, the new Jerusalem, coming back down. God dwelling with his people in the Garden of Eden kind of experience. It seems like that the Isaiah 11 of the earth and the animals and man being together, uh, to me, is the picture of, of what it's going to be like to be with the Lord. So I, I see heaven coming back to earth. God dwelling with his people, Old Testament theme. And, um, but this destruction idea of, of the cosmos is, is included all through the New Testament words. Notice the next little phrase. The earth and sky will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That's why Vernon read you that passage in, in Isaiah, Isaiah 40, verse 8. My words will never pass away. That same thing is recorded in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, where Jesus is saying, Not a jot or a tittle will pass away from this law till all is fulfilled. You see, there's something of an eternality about the Word of God, and there's something of a transitory nature about the things that we do and say and feel and touch. God's Word is the key. And here, Jesus' words and God's words are identified as one. So the earth and all that it has is going to pass away, but God's Word will never pass away. And then look at verse 32. But about that day, now that... When you see that little phrase, that day, if you're an Old Testament student, if you're an Old Testament reader, man, just right off, that, that phrase sticks out because that is a recurrent phrase in so many places in the Old Testament, I couldn't quote them all to you. That day refers to the day of the Lord when God is going to break into history and the Messiah is going to come in a Jewish expectation sense. So that day is just like this thing over here about the sun, the moon, and the stars in verse 24. Now, notice where it says, not a single one knows when that day is going to come. Now, it gives two illustrations to prove its point. One illustration has caused great problems for theologians. The key phrase is, no one knows. Not even the angels, not even the Son, but only the Father. Now, when it mentions the angels, the angels are depicted in scriptures as, as eavesdropping over God's plans, trying to figure out what God's going to do. That's when the Jews thought that the angels were trying to keep God's love for man because they were jealous. I think the angels have a personality and I think the angels have a free will. But the angels don't know when the world's coming to an end. You say, well, surely Jesus does. He's the main character. He's the one that's coming back. No, he said he didn't know. Jesus himself said he didn't know. Now, people have said, well, that means that Jesus didn't have complete knowledge of everything. That's right. Exactly what it means. You say, that means that Jesus is not the omnipresent, omnipotent God? No, that's not what it means. It means that, that very unusual phrase in Philippians 2, 6 through 11, that says, and he emptied himself, taking the form of a bond slave. What exactly Jesus emptied of himself to become a man, we don't know. But he did leave part of the majesty and glory 
that were rightfully his as being part of the Godhead, he left in heaven. And apparently one, other, one aspect of what he left was the Father's knowledge. Remember, Jesus kept saying all through his ministry, I'm not teaching you what I think. The words I give you are the Father's words. Over and over he kept repeating that. So, the Son did not know when the world was going to come to an end. Does that, does that surprise you? If the Son didn't know when the world was coming to an end, do you think our speculations are at best a little arrogant? Now, I, I think that you can know the general time. I think, again, Israel being back in the land is a real good key. I think uh, the, the, the greater the apostasy, I think that's a real good key. I think the more that people, that cult groups rise and the more that people's hearts grow apathetic, that's a good key. So I think we can kind of see that, hey, this pot is seething. This pot's not, not placid. Things are happening in God's timetable. We can see the bubbles coming up from, from what's cooking. But we can't tell by the intensity of the boil if it's time. We can know the general. We cannot know the specific. We can know the season. We cannot know the date. And I think that's, what, I think that's the biblical message throughout all these, these kinds of passages. Notice the Father alone knows. There's a beautiful passage in Deuteronomy 19:19. 19, 19. It says, The secret things of the Lord belong to him. If you knew when it was going to happen, you would live different. Wouldn't you? That song that says, If there was one more day, Evie sings it. Whatever Evie, whatever Evie sings, I like. It's not very theological, but I like it. <laughs> if you had one more day to live and you knew it was the last day, you wouldn't act characteristic of you. You wouldn't act by faith. Since God is trying, he has given us a life to live so that we respond to him by faith in every situation, he has not given us a theology book, he has given us a relationship book. God is waiting to see how we live our faith out in circumstances. If we knew the time, we would live different. And that would be what God wants for us. He wants us to live every day as if it was the day. He wants us to be ready because the time is going to surprise us. He wants us to be on guard. He wants us to be on the lookout. He wants us to be active, not asleep. That's the word. But it wants, he wants us to be active and on guard and alert, and alert in faith and not in knowledge. Yes, we ought to live every day as if it's the last day because we are the prime example of spiritual procrastination. But God will not tell us the day for he wants to live by faith and not by sight. Notice it says in verse 33 and verse 35, the last part of verse 37, present imperatives, all three. Keep on looking, keep alert. You must keep alert. And finally, keep alert. <laughs> the call, the clarion call of this is not go to seed on the second coming. It's not pick the date. It's not be so consumed. The clarion call is be ready. Be ready every day. Be ready in the night, in the day. Be ready. And the only way to be ready is to live every day by faith for Jesus Christ. When you know somebody needs to have a witness given to them, we need to give that witness. We don't have the promise of tomorrow for witnessing. We don't have the promise of tomorrow for loving people. We don't have the promise of tomorrow for confessing our sins. We don't have the promise for tomorrow for preaching the gospel. We've got to be ready, every day ready. That's why the Christian hope of the second coming is active in every believer's life. Now, I think there are some things that have to happen, so I'm not expecting him tomorrow theologically. Emotionally, experientially, I am expecting him tomorrow. I have got to live in a constant awareness that any day may be the day, knowing let me just say right here, the second coming is a beautiful, beautiful thing for us. It's going home. Going home. There'll be bells and shouts and singing and joy and clapping of hands and reunions like you can't believe. But for that man or woman that I've been putting off witnessing to, and that loved one that I never have told about Jesus Christ, and that person that I lived in such a way before that turned him off to God, it's not going to be homecoming for him. It's going to be hell for him. It's not going to be reunions and clapping and joy for him. It's going to be eternal separation from him. The second coming is the most horrible day in history combined with the most joyous day in history. 
when we pray for his coming, realize what you're praying for. I have got to the place in my own life that I pray for his not coming, if you can believe that. Pray for his not coming. Pray for a little more patience, God, with those who said no. Pray for a little more time that we can preach the gospel to around the world. Pray for one more child to understand. Pray for one more relative to say yes. Pray for one more chance. Finally, I want you to notice one thing. The 34 and following is a parable. Um, excuse me, let me go back to verse 30 and verse 32. I have done something that I think is probably not real good hermeneutics, but it seems to be real good because of the context. In verse 30, I've made the verse refer to the destruction of Jerusalem. Verse 32, I think, refers to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You say, how can two verses be different? All I can say to you is the context seems to imply that to me. And I go back to verse 4 where the question is asked and these two things are put together in one question. Really, they're two things. So I, I don't feel comfortable with it, but I don't know how else to handle it. Finally, the parable about the man who leaves his slaves in charge of his house. And that's exactly the picture of the Christian church. We are Jesus Christ. Mouth, hands, feet in the world today. He has left us with a task, the task of evangelism and the task of spiritual growth. He has put the most precious possession that he has in our keeping, and that is his creation. And for the most part, we are a sleeping, apathetic steward. Jesus says he's given each one his particular task. That's in verse 34. That, to me, again, reinforces my understanding of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and following, that every one of you here tonight have a spiritual gift, that you are the church, we are the church together, that we are to make an impact on society, that when we come together, we're not the church any more than we're in our workaday world. We are the ambassadors for Christ in our particular existential setting, be it work, be it school, be it neighborhood, we are the heralds of God's Word. My question is, have you so lived in your area of influence that you can pray for the Lord to come quickly? Or because of procrastination, apathy, do you pray with me, Lord, give me one more day, one more week, one more year? We love to talk about your coming, Lord, because we know for us it'll be the time that we don't have to struggle with sin anymore. It'll be the time that we don't have to realize this horrible fight between what ought and what is in our lives. It will be a time we to see the saints of every age together around your throne. And, oh, we long to see you, Lord. God, we're not going to be too happy when we see all those that we haven't witnessed to. We just can't be real excited, God, about the door being closed for our loved ones that we've been afraid to share with. And God, if it depended on us, being your spokesman in the group we're in, I'm not real sure, Lord, that we just want you to come right now. We thank you for your promises, sure. And we thank you there's a date fixed in eternity that no one can alter. But we also pray for gr greater faith to live day by day. We thank you for the tingling in our spine as we think of that day for us. And we pray for boldness in our mouth as we share with others. Forgive us, Lord, for living our own lives unto ourselves. Help us to take up your cross and follow after you daily. Help us realize the tremendous spiritual battle that we're in. Help us to realize our key and indispensable place in it. In Jesus' name, amen.